Welcome to the Fly Culture Podcast, bringing you interviews, reviews, and fishing tips. Here's your host, Pete Tigus. Jeff Johnson is a guide, casting instructor, and passionate fly angler. He spends most of his time on the River Eden fishing for pleasure or showing anglers his home water. I plan to learn about his fishing career, the River Eden, and pick up some tips too. Jeff, it's wonderful to have you on the Fly Culture podcast today. How are you doing? Not bad, Pete. Not bad. Um, how, are you? how are you? I'm very well indeed. We've got some heavy rain coming in. It was one of those mornings this morning. This is being recorded on the 5th of June, and I walked the dog very early on. And it felt those really good conditions. You know, it's overcast. It feels close. I just checked the weather before we came on to record this. And there's some heavy rain coming in just about lunchtime. So once we've recorded this, I may hot foot down to the river and see if there's the last of the mayfly. But how's your fishing been? Has it been good? How's the season been so far for you? It's been interesting. Um... The hatches weren't what they normally are early season. Um, I never really saw a good hatch of large darks or March browns. It was more of a, a trickle. Uh, it really kicked off with the granum. The granum was tremendous. We had massive hatches of that. And then followed that by, again, uh, normally followed by olive uprights, um, iron blue duns. They weren't great this year, but we had some fantastic falls of black gnat, which made up for it and some great spot on the black gnats. And then the mayfly started. Um, mayfly were good, relatively good. I mean, we don't get massive hatches of mayfly on our rivers, but we are seeing more, and uh, the fish do turn onto them. So, so I had some good spot on the mayfly on occasions. Yeah, and I, it's interesting you say that the mayfly has improved do you think and i know we were talking about um rivers and the state of rivers before we started recording do you think that's because there is more silt being deposited into the river and therefore the mayfly nymphs are kind of enjoying that and the hatch has got a little bit bigger as a as a result of that yeah possibly i mean i'm no expert i'm no entomologist uh but yeah i guess that there's a chance it could be that and i know one or two do say that I've seen uh, comments online recently on social media where people are blaming, you know, rivers getting silted up for the increase in numbers. But, uh, but like I say, I'm no expert, so I don't know. I mean, we have seen a, a gradual increase over the years, so it could be that. Yeah. And do you find that our hatch I always describe as that there's not a flotilla of mayflies floating down the river so that the fish become especially picky? Is it the sort of hatch for you that there's enough, like you say, that the fish get locked on, but not so many that your flies lost in many that are coming down the river? Yeah, we don't get loads. Uh, we tend to get trickles of mayfly and then the odd short flurry. And it tends to be when you get the short flurry that the fish turn onto them. I mean, I was out one day, was it last week or the week before? And I didn't think it was going to happen. And it was about half three, quarter four. We had a little flurry, not, you know, not hundreds, 20, 30, not many at all. It lasted about 15 minutes and fish turned onto them. But like I said, it was all over in about 15 minutes and then they just switched off again. And that's what it tends to be like on our waters, or well, in my experience anyway. Yeah, that sounds similar to ours too. And here's a question for you. I was, um, I've been fishing the hatch. I've been fishing a fair bit. And the takes of fish have been kind of interesting. And it's got me thinking a little bit about the fish how they're behaving and where they are actually in the water column. And the reason I say this is that I'd been fishing and I did a podcast with my friend Warren and we had one of those days where the fish were on it from the very start. The takes were good and positive and I came back, I think it was two or three days later with my friend Perry and I said, I think they're on them. We fished and he rose a really nice fish that didn't stick and then it took me back to 
actually this was pre Mayfly, and I was fishing with um, a fly culture contributor and a podcast guest, Dan Osman, and there was a fish rising. And I covered it, and I thought, yep, this is for me. I've, I think I've got this one. It came up, and they're, they're, they're okay-sized fish, and I know I can just lift into them. And there was nothing there. And this got me thinking a little bit more that do you think this, and sometimes I know I overthink these things, but it's to do possibly with where they are in the water column. So if the fish is sort of just subsurface, it knows there's a game of foot, and it's just sitting there, those takes to me – are easy uh, hookups and the fish sort of just comes to it, eats it, I lift and I'm in. Whereas if the fish may have been rising, but it's come from slightly deeper, that the way the fish takes the fly is slightly different and it's coming up on the fly a little bit more. And there's been, it's happened to me a couple of times. I mentioned that time with Dan and the, the, the my friend Perry as well. And it happened a couple of times to me that I'm thinking, this is a nailed on fish. It comes to me. I just lift. I do nothing different expecting it. Let it eat it. I'm not hitting it quickly or anything. I'm giving it time lifting and there's nothing there. There is, of course, the ref- potential for refusal of as well but it it made me wonder if it's the way that the fish is rising in the water column that it's a little bit deeper have you any thoughts on that have you thought about this have you come across this any any thoughts about it yeah possibly i mean it could be the angle it's coming at um i mean those fish that are higher in the water tend to roll on the fly sometimes think like a dolphin they just sort of roll at the surface head and tail and uh those are often easier to hook. You know, that sometimes when they're coming from depth as well, it's a faster take and it's more of a slash sometimes, and it could be part of that. Um, but, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, um, I think it could be the angle. Um, yeah, yeah, possibly. I mean, it's fishing. You just don't know. There's so many unpredictables and so much unknown about it. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I love about it. And it is, you know, because the next lead on to that is, well, do I need to think a bit more about how I'm setting on the fish? And I'm sort of giving them for Devon, you know, Devon's pretty well known that you've got to set on them pretty quickly. And it's taken me time to think about, right, okay, I've got to wait a little bit longer. Let's just lift into that one. And I had actually, and I sat on a fish for a good, my dog was bored shitless it really was it was sitting waiting for some magic to happen i'd seen a fish rising and it was a good fish and it gave me two goes at it as well and often where we are at home um one and it's done and they've 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 gone away and this guy i changed flies i waited for a bit and he came again and i still couldn't get him to eat that fly and that again made me think right okay and I I remember saying to myself at the time I'm sure many people listening and I'm sure sure yourself Jeff as well that I'm thinking right perhaps I give him a little bit longer that's an easy thing to think about isn't it but to actually do in the heat of the moment when you know you're sitting on a a nice fish there's those little things and like you say they're the things that keep us coming back don't they and I I always try and learn something from a, a day's fishing and this one particularly to me had been in the back of my mind because it happened pre mayfly but also I, I remembered it kind of from last year as well that the way they they were taking it, it I, I guess do you think it could also be a, a last minute pull away as well from the fish possibly possibly I mean I've seen that on the lakes I fish dules water and sometimes in clear conditions when you've got polaroids on you can see fish coming from depth for your fly and they'll they'll turn away at the last second. You know, and if I hadn't seen had the Polaroids on in the clear water, I wouldn't have even known that fish had come. But you see them, they come from depth and then they'll just turn away at the, at the last second. And so it could be part of that. They'll they'll come up to it and they'll think, hmm, don't like that, and drop down again, turn away. And I mean time in your strike, <laughs> that's an interesting one that. I mean I think it can vary from fish to fish. You know, I mean, years ago, they used to talk about, you say, God save the queen before you strike. Yeah, with some fish, especially bigger fish, that seems to work. With smaller fish, you've got to be lightning quick. You know, and I find nowadays I've slowed down a lot. I've, I've sort of relaxed a little bit and I don't rush now. And I will slow down my strike, especially if I think it's a good fish. Um, I listened, and I can't remember the name of the guy, 
I listened to a podcast, uh, an American podcast, and the guy on there said, uh, I thought it was a good thing to follow. He said, the slower the rise, the slower the take, the faster the rise, sorry, the slower the strike, the faster the rise, the faster the strike. So if a fish slashes at your fly, you, you hit it. If you get that slow roll, you slow it down, you wait. And I mean, in New Zealand, that happens a lot, doesn't it? You've, you've got to let them go down with the fly. I mean, that cost me fish the first time I went out there. Well, absolutely. And that got me thinking, that's where this whole process has come from. The ver- I still remember the very first fish I hooked in New Zealand. And it was almost going vertically up to take stuff. And it was I was fishing with my um, buddy Ray, and and we had a guide for our first day because we thought we might be able to find some spots, which didn't work because he took us door deep through the river and everything else. So that was never going to work. But this fish was coming up, and I was thinking, please don't miss this, Pete, when it, it came. And it was almost vertically coming up, taking the fly and coming down. And it felt like an eternity, but I made sure – it felt that way. And that's where this thought process I think has come from. You know, they're not sort of New Zealand size fish. I'm catching they're good fish for certainly for the West country. And that slower strike definitely helps. But thinking about how he came vertically up, because you could see him sort of coming up like a, almost not like a torpedo, but almost that way. And so I did have to wait for a long time to do that. So it's been a, 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 very interesting, and I'm, I'm going to put it to, hopefully if I get lucky a little bit later, think about that a little bit more. The big problem with this, of course, isn't it, is in the heat of the moment when you're sitting on a fish and that fish takes. That's the hard bit, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I mean, we've had to change, uh, or I've had to change the way I do it now because years ago when we didn't get many big fish, you know, if you got one three-pound fish a season, you were doing really well. We used to find them in those days when the fish were smaller, you had to be lightning fast. It was like as soon as it rose, you hit it. Where now I've had to slow myself down, you know, and I have said to myself, wait, 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 you know, and, and just give it time to turn with the fly. And I, it, it's like now when I strike, it's like striking in slow motion sometimes. I've really had to try and slow it down. And I, I think that's maybe, maybe because we're getting bigger fish than we used to get. I mean, not loads, but we are getting bigger fish. Yeah, absolutely. I've noticed that as well. And, and you know, where I've been fishing, it's been nicer fish. What do you think? Do you think there's a reason for that, that, that um, you're, you're, you're finding those bigger fish and that, that change? It's been similar for me. Um, I'm fishing somewhere different. I'm fur- fishing further down the river. And, you know, a friend of mine, Luke, described it as a sweet spot on the river for the trout. But I'm sort of not finding a fish and continually catching it. I'm finding them in different places, but I've been uh, amazed by that. What What do you think the reason for that is? Do you think there we can attribute it to anything? Well, I mean, we can have our opinions. I don't suppose we'll ever really know, but I think possibly two reasons. One, more anglers are fish and catch and release, so these fish are going back. Uh, so hopefully, you know, they're living longer, they're getting more time to grow. And I think the other reason is there's less fish. So less fish and more food for what's left. So they they may be getting a better feed. You know, I sometimes when I'm uh, guiding people, I try and compare them to us. And when it comes to that, I'll sometimes say, if there was a group of people in a room with a, and a table full of food, you'd be all fighting for that food. And you'd all, you'd all get a little bit, but you wouldn't get fat. If there was one person in that room, and he could eat at his leisure and fill his face with what's on the table, he's going to get fatter, he's going to get bigger. Maybe it's partly that, I don't know. I mean, we all have our theories, but I don't suppose we'll ever really know. But, but that's what I think. I mean, there's definitely less fish. I don't know how you find it, but I mean, I know what it was like when I was a kid. I mean, we didn't have much idea, um, and we still caught plenty of fish. You know, a lot of it was just swinging wet. I mean, I used to th- fish things like, you know, winged wets, bloody butchers and things like that. And all the dry flies were quite heavily hackled. You know, wouldn't dream of fishing some of the stuff we used to fish. But we caught fish, and I think in those days there was just more of them. There was more competition for food, so they were easier to catch. 
now, if you want, they can be a bit more picky. There's less of them, and they can eat at the leisure. And and does that mean that your approach to the fish has changed? Like you say, those flies that you've changed, it may be from a downstream presentation to an upstream pressure. Have you have you seen that 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 how you're approaching, or is that experience as well and a knowledge? The more that you sort of done it. Uh I still like to fish all the techniques, so I will fish, you know, spiders are crossing down, I'll upstream nymph, I like fishing dries. Um, I think what has changed is the flies as much as anything. I mean, approach matters as well. Like I say, I think the fish are, because they get more pressure now as well, they're a little bit warier than they used to be. They can be hard. You know, I mean, our rivers, are, are, I think our rivers are tough rivers to fish. I've always maintained, and I know I'm biased, and you might think the same about yours. But I always say, if you can, if you can master our rivers, you can fish anywhere, you know, because they can be tough, really tough. Yeah, ours are exactly the same. In the podcast I did with my friend Warren McCarthy the other day, he'd been coming down a bit. He'd been, you know, he'd caught or hooked a, a sizable trout to two plus pound that didn't quite make it to the net. And we'd had, you know, I, I suspect with similar anglers, Jeff, in that the sense that we'll look for those rising fish and wait for those rising fish. And like you say, the start of the season has been not a frustrating one, but a challenging one in the sense of it looked as though we were all set coming into the season, that it was going to be good weather and everything else. Temperatures dipped dramatically and that had an impact on the hatches all the way through so the fish that we hoped would be rising didn't really rise the hatches weren't what we hoped they would be and so as a result it had been tough going and even when I was guiding you know we'd say similar sort of stuff that it's tough and 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 that kind of to me I think makes it interesting and and the challenge of trying to understand it and as a guide I I know that you'll want to understand the reason for what is happening why you're catching but why you're not catching but probably more importantly as well why you are catching as well isn't it that's that's important too isn't it oh definitely definitely I mean it's an interesting one that I mean I think it's more about why you're not catching it's great when they're on when they're not on it's a case of why why are they not interested? And with that, there can be so many variables. I mean, as a guide, you're often watching, and and it can be, it can be well on our water. I mean, you're talking about, you know, you've had some rain. We far found in our water, sometimes if we get a lift, maybe just even two inch, that slight drop in water temperature can knock them off the feed for 24 hours. But not always. I mean, again. I mean, you've probably heard it. They say there's two words you can't use in fly fishing, never and always, you know. So it doesn't always happen, but quite often you get that slight lift and it's just that two inch of water and it just knocks them off just for 24 hours and then they'll come back on again. It's like they have to acclimatise to the changing conditions or the changing temperature. When they're on, I don't really think about it that much. I mean, to be honest, if they're on, they're on and you've, you know, you've got to make the best of it. Um but those days are quite rare now. I mean, like I say, it can, it can be tough. It can, and it, as a guide, it's very frustrating sometimes because you know the potential of the water, you know what's in there, but they don't always perform, and uh, that can be very frustrating, as you know. Yeah, th- there's a pride, isn't there, that you're showing how much you love that river and you want them to feel the same about it too and when it doesn't perform then it's it is a a little bit um trickier it's interesting what you said about that lift and the water temperature and i find that it is stable conditions is what the fish like i guess it's almost routine and for me where i fish actually um, and it is slightly bigger river there. It's, it, it, you know, it is. I try again on this podcast I've done on this this stretch of river. I've tried to describe it. it is a little bit bigger, but the lower it is, the better it is. And I find those um, rising fish um, a little bit more consistently as well. So I don't, I, you know, I want some rain. I want to be able to swing some flies, some salmon at some stage. But I don't mind if there is no water because i think i can find some 
rising fish. So yeah, I think stable is is pretty good, isn't it? I've found, well, you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, stable. I've found over the years, um, trout and grayling, they like settled conditions, no matter what it is, even if it's a big water. They like it to be, you know, if it's big for a few days, they'll adjust and they'll, they'll come on the feed. If it's low, they'll come on the feed, but it needs to be settled. It needs to be stable, whatever it is, whether it's big or low. You know, they don't like changeable conditions. It's the same in the winter for the grayling. You know, you get changeable conditions, changeable water levels, changeable temperatures. It just knocks them right off. And they like it settled. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm with, with you on that. I'm getting a sense already of you as an angler, but if I had to ask you and say, well, I'm going to ask you, how would you describe yourself as an angler um, to our listeners? Oh, gosh, that's interesting. Um an all-rounder. I like fishing all techniques. Um, I like the challenge. I don't like it easy. Um, and don't get me wrong, but I've been down in the south on the chalk streams with, uh, with a good friend of mine, Paul Proctor, and we've caught lots of fish. And it was great to go down and fish the likes of the test and that. But once I'd been there and done it, I wanted to come back home again. I found it and, and again, I'm not being big headed, but with maybe we just hit it right. But I found it too easy. I like a bit of a challenge. Um, so I'm, I think I'm relaxed about my fishing now. I mean, I don't I don't bother about numbers. I don't bother about size. I just love fishing, and I go out and I get what I get. Sometimes I do well, or sometimes I get numbers. I should say. Sometimes I don't, and I don't really. You know, I just love being on the water. Um, Last year, we had a particularly tough year, and I had a few guys ring me up um, and make, making comments like, it's the worst season they've ever known. And they kept saying, how was your season? I said, well, great. I said, I don't look at my season like that. You know, Every season that I can fish is a good season, and I quite like the challenge. So for me, it was challenging, but it was interesting. And I don't know about you, Pete, but when I go on the river and I have a tough day, I go home with ideas. And sometimes I go home and tie flies or I alter my leaders or things like that. And then I can't wait to get back and try it again. So I like experimenting as well. So I don't know if that's the sort of answer you want, but I mean, with me and my fishing, I just, I love it. I, I mean, people say to me, you couldn't go every day, could you? And I say, yep, easy. And I could, maybe not the same bit of water, but I could fish every day. I mean, every day is different. Every day is a school day. And I just, I just love it. Yeah, yeah. Good answer as well that, yeah, you know, it is all good. And I, I'm like you, that the more complicated or the more difficult it is, the more that reward of a fish. And it does, you know, it's been amazing this season. I don't know if social media is a, a, a handle to judge things fully on, but it seems as though size of fish this year seems to be extraordinary. And you mentioned Paul. I'll exclude him from that because he's a freak of nature anyway and extraordinary angler. But it seems as though nicer fish. And I've sort of, you know, it, I've just come round to this. And I've always felt this, but, you know, I've been catching a few nice fish recently. And I took some pictures and one looks like I've had some sort of episode but it was I was trying to do a set my camera on timer and I didn't know whether it taken the picture or not so it looked ridiculous but they're all beautiful aren't they and and sometimes even myself yeah I look inwardly and say come on that was a 12 13 inch fish that was as beautiful as the two pounder and sometimes I I have to give myself a talking to about that to say these beautiful wild fish appreciate and love every single one of them it, a successful day isn't by the size of the fish you've caught i kind of like the challenge of those bigger guys but any rising fish and I, I think again on one of the podcasts i mentioned with warren we left we saw they were small fish you know five five six inch fish we left them alone because it felt right to do that now it wasn't they weren't big enough for me i'd never say that but it felt right to leave those guys alone give them a little bit more of a, a feeding time with it but you know I caught a 13 14 inch fish the other day which was beautiful 
and I took a photo of it and then I happened to catch a bigger fish and I, I hadn't forgotten about that one but I thought come on Pete it's not just that isn't a successful day because you've had an amazing day on the water there's a danger sometimes if we're lucky enough to catch some big fish that you focus on that as the success of the day not the success of being able to go fishing and sometimes we can be a little bit pulled and distorted by it can't we yeah i mean i try not to fall into that trap i mean social media's got a lot to answer for everybody seems to want the trophy shot now for social media and they're not interested in the smaller fish i mean i've even had guys ring me up and say you know uh we want you to guide for us but we're only interested in big fish will you take us to where you get your good fish and i say no i don't do that you know, uh, I'm not interested in that sort of thing. And to be honest, uh, there's a chance of big fish anywhere on the river, really. It's just a case of whether you come across them or not. But, uh, I mean, like you, if fish are obviously small, very small, you know, sometimes I think just leave them alone, you know. But, again, going on the other side, if I get a big fish from an area, I won't go back there and try and catch it again. I think just leave it alone now. You know, but but I don't intentionally go looking for big fish. I mean, I've, I have found as I've got older, and especially these last couple of years, I've I've started to do more and more dry fly fishing, and I'm I'm quite happy just to walk the river and look for rising fish. I mean, if you do that, you've got to be prepared to blank, which I don't mind anyway. You know, but but that's more just as the. I think I've got a bit lazy in my old age. You know, sometimes when you're nymphing, nymphing can be hard work. It's constant, and sometimes I just think, oh, I can't be bothered. You know, and I've just walked with the dry fly and just looked for rice and fish and just picked off the odd one and really enjoyed it. And that's when sometimes I tend to get the better fish as well. Yeah, I think that's dead right. The patience aspect of it for me has paid dividends and that might be the reason rather than, and I've said previously on these things, that rather than fishing the water, fishing to the fish, I think has worked pretty well for me from that point of view. And then also when I've seen a nice fish, I've got a better chance of setting on it because I might frighten a fish away by fishing the water as well. A good one's about to come on the feed and you could potentially, so I'm like you, that I may come away and that again, I think sometimes with social media and there's fish I don't, there's a lot of nice fish I've caught that I don't post um, because I try and mix everything to give people a sense of, and it's only my humble opinion it's only what i i try and do that it's not just about that for me and so it's the whole thing and i just put a picture out just the other day of you know some ranunculus on our river and just said home water and it's nice it's the whole big encompassing picture yeah i do get if people have only got a day you know we're lucky jeff that we're on the river a lot that people only get a day or two of fishing so they want to share that so i get that aspect of it as well um, but I found, yeah, taking time definitely works. And I found as well, and I think I, I may have said previously, I don't know about you, but if I've caught a really nice fish, I'll snip off and go home. That's that's fine because I always worry that I'm not going to do the next fish the honour and service that I think it deserves. So if I've caught a nice fish, I snip off and go home. Are you are you similar in that sense? Um, no, I, I mean I, I don't snip off and go home, but I. I still like to wander. I still like being there. I still like to watch. And uh, I maybe if I get a good fish, I'll I'll carry on fishing, but I maybe won't fish as hard. I'm thinking, oh, well, that's it. You know, I've had a nice fish today. I'm quite happy now. You know, and I'll, I'll carry on fishing, but be a lot more relaxed about it. I mean, I haven't said that. I mean, maybe saying I'll be a lot more relaxed is the wrong thing to say because, like I said earlier, I'm, I don't worry whether I catch or not. You know, I just love being out there. So, but... I'll still I'll stay and I'll still wander, you know, and, and watch. And I like watching, you know. I mean, I think that's how you learn. I mean, when I'm out with people, I'll often say, "Watch, just take your time and watch." And I mean, you talk about, you know, walking with the dry fly. Sometimes, if you don't watch, you never come across these fish. Sometimes you've just got to stop and look at a potential bit of water, and you might just see a little dimple or a little sip that if you'd been wandering or nymphing somewhere else, you wouldn't have seen. I mean, I had it um, a couple of weeks ago. I uh, 
I was on the river and I saw a lovely bit of water, soft bit of water on the opposite bank, and I thought, well, that's perfect for a fish. I'm just going to watch it for a while. And to be honest, I stopped and had a pee and had a drink of water and just watched it, and I just saw a little neb stick, stick out. And I watched, and it came out again. Three times it came out, and then I moved on to it. And that fish was, what was that one? Four pound, one ounce, I think it was. And if I hadn't stopped and watched, I'd never have seen that, never have come across it. You know, so sometimes you've got to do it. You've got to watch the water. You know, people assume that these big fish make big, splashy risers. Sometimes they can make the tiniest of dimples. Yeah, that's some great advice there. And uh, I was just thinking while you were talking about that as well, about, you know, uh, what you said about guiding when people booked you and wanted to catch big fish. I guess from a guiding perspective, it's difficult if you've got a couple of people, haven't you, getting them to watch the water and be patient. And you, I know it's always nice to get a, a, a fish in the net to start the day as well. But if you've got somebody, because they feel, I guess, and you feel you want to give value for money in the sense of their fishing, and it's, it, it's an interesting um, path to, to wander down, isn't it, from that point of view? Yeah, I think when you're guiding, it's a bit of a different scenario because when you're on your own, like you said, we're on the water a lot. We can afford to walk and watch and sacrifice the day if you want. A guy that's coming on holiday and he gets one chance to fish our river, he's not coming to walk and watch. You know, so then it's you tend to work the water. You know, you're looking for the fish. And if you come across a rising fish, great. But if you're not, you know, you'll use other techniques, you know, because for me it's not all about catching fish, but as a guide you feel obliged to try and get people fish. That's what they're coming for. You know, so not everybody. I know a lot of guys that will come and they say, you know, I'm not bothered about catching. If I catch, I catch. It's just about being here. But I don't know what you were like as a guide, but, you know, I think it's part of the job. You want to get people fish. Yeah, there's nothing like that first fish in the net feeling. And also that comment that you use that I don't mind if I catch fish or not. I think the skill of a good guy is actually spotting whether they mean that or not. And sometimes they'll say that, yet they want to they want to catch a bunch of fish, don't they? And then, then it doesn't sort of happen uh, and play out that way. I have to be careful what I say. I don't want to say the wrong thing and upset people. But I know, I mean, I've, I've, I've I know guys that I've had in the past, and they say they're not bothered, but it doesn't take you long to realise that they are really they want to catch fish. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me something. While we're on this topic, why should somebody um, book a guide these days? Why why should they do that? What do you? Um, how do people approach you, and and why should they book a guide if they're thinking of booking one? The way I see it, I mean, um, we all lead busy lives nowadays. Everybody works long hours. You know, they're, they're very very busy, and they don't have the time to to put into it what we've done. You know, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I was young, we lived on the rivers and I still live on the rivers now. You know, I love it. And a lot of people don't have that opportunity. So I see us as a shortcut to success, if you want. When it comes to casting, they don't have time to experiment and, you know, learn through trial and error. So we can teach them shortcuts. We can iron out any faults, um, put them right in certain aspects. When it comes to actually fishing, you know, put them right on the techniques because with all techniques or all methods, there's there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. I mean, I have guys that come to me and will use spider fishing, if you want, for an example, North Country spiders, and they'll say, all I ever catch is small fish. And I'll say, well, let me see what you're doing. And they'll cast at 45 degrees, tip to the water. The flies are swinging around, wrong angle, way too fast. And I'll say, well, that's why you're only catching small fish. You need to change your angle of delivery put a mend in or whatever you know and we can do that for people you know so that's the way i look at it really if you want it's a it's a shortcut to come to people like us yeah absolutely and like you say it's a hard river that you're guiding on i know you know where i was guiding previously that it's a tough river as well and it allows you to open it up for them and like you say they learn something on the day as well and and you know hopefully catch a fish or two as you know, Pete, it can be a very, very fine line between success and failure, if you want. A very fine line. Angular presentation, 
you know, putting them in, in not drag free drifts and things like that. And I mean, I remember talking to to Howard Croston about it one day, and uh, and we were talking. I said there could be a fine line between success and failure, and he says, "Oh yeah, he said, it can be minuscule. You know, it could be a very very fine line, and it can. I mean, you'll see it, and I see it all the time." I was going to say, and going back to what you said about rising fish earlier, you know, I mean, when they're high in the water, their window of vision is very, very small. So you can be inches out, inches out, and they don't even see the fly. You know, and people don't think about that. They think, oh, as long as I get it near enough, they'll come and take it. But sometimes you can be, you know, just a few inches out, and they're not even seeing the fly. Yeah, and those bigger fish as well aren't going to travel anywhere, but are they? They want it right over their nose and and don't want to move for it at all. Yeah. And sometimes you get one chance. I mean, you you said earlier, but you know you have two or three chances at a fish. Sometimes you get one chance, and if you mess it up or you miss it, the fish goes down and it, you never see it again. I reckon that fish I was talking about the other day was one of the few in that I've been seriously fishing these rivers for 20 years, and I reckon that's one of the few that's given me a second bite. Um, and I can't think of many others that have given me a second go from there. So that was, you know, a, a noteworthy. If the feeding had, I mean, I don't know what your hatches are like, but, but sometimes if the feeding had, you know, you'll get, sometimes I've had occasions when I'll get chance after chance if the feeding had. It's like automatic pilot. It's pop, 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 pop. But if they're not, you know, you'll get one chance. Yeah, our fish are more the latter. That it is, you know, generally one. They're not massive blanket hatches. That the fish are just. I had one, funnily enough, the other day that I started the day, and a fish at the tail of the pool was just going, 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 and I'd gone there with the. You know, it was going to be mayflies, but I put on the old pearl button merger because I could see it was taking, it wasn't mayfly um, emergers and caught it pretty quickly that it was a, and, and those, you know, I get them, don't get me wrong, but they're not constantly on the whole time. So it's been really, really um, fun to see those moments and and get a go at them. But we touched on social media, and that must be useful now as a tool for you as a fishing guide, isn't it? Because that shows that you're out and about on the water. And I think that's one of the, the key things for a guide is to show that they're out, they're in touch, they've got their finger on the pulse of that home water, and their clients are catching fish. It, it must be a great way of, uh, you know, it was only sort of getting going, I guess, when and, and that huge spike when I was sort of leaving it, but it's it must have been a, a massive change from, and I still believe word of mouth is probably the best form of advertising, but social media, if you've got somebody with a nice trout or a happy angler or whatever that may be, it must be a great way of reaching people too, mustn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. But uh, <laughs> if I was honest, I've got to be careful with social media because I've got a bit of a love-hate relationship with it because I think it, it can be responsible for some areas getting a lot of pressure. Um, I mean, you know what fishing's like to be like a secret society, but there's a reason for that. You know, you don't want areas to get overly pressured. So, so if I was honest, I do. It is a great advertising tool. I mean, it's a great way to let people see where, what you're doing, that your clients are catching. But, um, but I think it's got to be used carefully as well. I mean, we've all got different opinions, but I do. If I was honest, I do have a bit of a love hate relationship with it. I think that's the common comment that I hear from it as a whole, and I think probably people do share that. It's nice to share it, um, something, a moment, a thought, whatever it may be. Um, it may be nice, and it is nice to to look at these things as well. Um, but, yeah, I wouldn't ever use it as a driving motivation for my fishing uh, or worry about what everyone else is doing. I just sort of kind of do what I do and and – see what happens we get a bit busier because the new magazine's coming out so i do a little bit more then and of course the fishing's been pretty good so you want to share those moments as well um but let's move that on to tackle and um let's talk about rods let's start with those and what are you using what do you look for in a fly rod um yeah what are you what are you up to on that front at the moment well, at the moment, I'm with Scott McKenzie on the pro team, so I'm using his rods, and the, he's done a really good job on them. They're really nice rods. Um, as far as 
my preferred rod. I like something a bit softer. I don't like a fast action rod. You know, I, I like a, sort of a mid flex or middle to tip. Just something a little. It's got a little bit of give in it. Um, I class myself as quite a lazy caster. I think my action's quite slow, so um, I like something a little bit softer. Um, I have this last season and a half, I would think, gone away. My favourite, my go-to at one time was always a nine-five. I st- and I still say to people, it's a good all-rounder, a nine-foot-five weight. But if honest, the last eighteen months, two years, I've been using a ten-foot-four weight, and I really like it. Really like it. I'm not. I'm not. A, I don't like carrying two rods. I'm a one rod man, and I try and have a. I, I want a rod that will do anything I want really. And at the moment, the ten four Mackenzie that I'm using, it'll fish French leader, it'll fish dry fly, nymph, uh, spiders. It'll do anything I want. So, for if for a one rod man, for me personally, you know, it, it's ideal. So that's the the one I'm using at the moment. Yeah, I spent some time with that rod and the eight and a half for a three in that range I liked very much as well. I thought that was a, a cracking little rod. And that, you know, we do have this trend towards those bigger, longer rods for the obvious reasons, mending line, controlling line, et cetera, et cetera. I found I've been using where I'm fishing a shorter rod only because of the casts I've got to make so that I've got to make a high back cast but a low forward cast. And I found with a shorter rod, I can get it in under those branches with much more ease. And with you, you know, we've talked many times on this podcast with many guests um, about that less stiffer rod. And we're seeing a movement from rod manufacturers away from stiffer rods now anyway, aren't we? But from a perspective of playing fish, I think my success has been greater as a result of using more uh, softer action rods. Have you have you found that too? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you've got to have a bit of give in the system somewhere, you know, and, and I like a rod that will bend into a fish. Um, and again, you know, when you're talking about that, you know, when you're playing fish, I tend to, I don't know what you do, Pete, but I tend to play from, from the side more than anything now. I mean, years ago, they used to talk about getting that rod high, you know, but I like to side strain more i hate to see i think when you play that fish with the rod high you draw them straight up to the surface and i hate to see fish rolling around on the surface i'm always saying get down get down and i'll you know i'll turn the rod on its side and and play them with side strain and also i think you get a lot better bend on the rod as well sometimes when you're playing with the high rod tip they get to a certain position where there's just the tip bending and if, especially if you're getting close to netting the fish and it makes that final dart for freedom, there's no giving the system. There's no place where for anything to go and it'll either break you or the fly will pull. So, so yeah, I do think the, the softer rod's much nicer for playing fish. Absolutely. And there's not that need to throw a massive long line up the river anyway, is there? That if you can stealthily get into position, wait a bit, you just don't need to throw a massive long line. And I always think the longer the line, the more chance of drag or micro drag anyway. So if I can feel I can get, and it's surprising if you've got a happy feeding fish and you are relatively stealthy, how close you can get to them. That's the case, isn't it? Good. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, the way I look at it is, especially on the rivers anywhere, you know, good fishing, successful fishing, it's all about good control, good presentation. And you get that by, you know, fishing a shorter line. The longer the line you fish, the less control you have, the the worse your presentation. So good river fishing is all relatively short range stuff, really. Yeah, I think it would surprise people how close you can actually get to them and it's a and if i'm sure many of the listeners do this already but it's it, it's worth trying to see how close you can get to a fish um without spooking it and seeing what that response actually is it you might be pleasantly surprised and you know sometimes i'm no distance at all and it's sometimes it's a flip the other interesting thing is that while i'm waiting on a fish i can have a fish opposite me rise And I can cut it happened just the other day and, you know, it will rise if you're standing there quietly enough. And and I reckon I made a cast. It was probably 10, 12 feet. 
barely a bit of leader and and the thing took and it it happened to be a nice fish and it it just goes to show sometimes if you are I, I guess this is a theme that's coming through with a lot of these podcasts patience isn't it and you've alluded to that Jeff a lot in this patience isn't it I had it last night uh, I was on the river last night and there was a good hatch of blue winged olives and I was standing watching the the olives come down the river and watching fish rise and they were moving around because there was there was quite a few olives on the water and they were moving around picking them off and there was a fish rose to the right of me no more than a rod length away and that's just because I wasn't moving I was just standing still watching and this thing just settled in beside me and started rising yeah that's a great lesson and yeah observation patience uh they, they seem to be common themes with with my guests on the the podcast. So that is wonderful to hear. Um, You talked about blue winged olive hatch last night, and perhaps we may get some of those as well. I'll keep an eye out. And um, I know Nigel Rainson sent me a picture. He's been seeing them in down here in Devon, I think. And that will be fun. Are you somebody who carries loads of fly patterns with them? Or do you uh, have comfort with what you have and you have fly flies that you feel that you can, probably um catch most fish on um no i don't have a lot of patterns what i what i think is very important is size uh, when it comes to dries uh size silhouette i'm a big believer in footprint things like that i mean you talked about i think before we started you talked about reading um i don't know if you've read um dry flying angler's code vincent marinaro he talked a lot about the footprint, the impression the fly makes on the surface. And based on experience and things I've seen when I've been out and about, I think, you know, there's a lot of, you can put a lot of store in that and it can be important. So I'll have, I'll have flies that different sizes, uh, duns, emerges, and maybe a few that'll give a different footprint if you want, a different impression in the water. Uh, but as far as sort of colours and things like that goes, I don't bother a lot. Uh, when it comes to nymphing, again, size is important, but depth can be absolutely critical. So I'll have nymphs, not a lot of different colours, but in a, it, a, a variety of sizes and weights. So I mean, we're all different. I know guys that have boxes and boxes of flies, but um, if you looked in mine, you probably wouldn't be that impressed, really, because there's not a lot of different patterns. It's it's all about size. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you on that. I don't use many and I've cut that back and I've got two little boxes. I have a reserve box just in case and my fly patch. I always say people ask about the fly and if they've, you know, as a guide, I said, just look at my patch. They'll tell you what I'm using right now and you'll see there's not many um, patterns on there. My my fly patch has got mayflies only at the moment with – just the odd pearl but i don't really tend to not because it's not a snob thing or anything else i'm just really enjoying i have more time to fish so like you've been saying jeff i'd just like to walk the river and see if i can find a fish that wants to rise and eat the fly and then if i can figure out what it is and i've talked many times on here and about you know i love that pearl butter merger pulls um pattern that's just caught me so many fish in so many places that that's a default i'll look at a midge pattern if there's a bit of wind i think about terrestrials um i'll make those changes the the pearl but i only find for me works in a size 14 i've tried smaller there will be cases of course it works but a 14 for whatever reason that is um seems to work really well for me i've got some longer ones that are a little bit scruffier that seem to work really well but i i don't really need a a great deal of patterns and i think that allows me yeah to express what i want to do and how i want to cover that fish and i think as you've alluded to it's more about the presentation and drift as well isn't it yeah i mean yeah and but i mean size can be critical and um one thing i'll sometimes say to people when i, I take them out is if you're struggling if you're on the river and there's fish rising and you're struggling stop fishing just stop and watch and just watch for a while, and if you and look down. Sometimes look down at the water, and you'll see things floating past you. And just as a quick example, I'll, I'll, uh, I had a day on the Upper Eden a few years ago, and um, there was large dark olives hatching, and there was granum hatching, and there was fish rising. 
And I thought, oh, it'll be on large darks. I put a large dark on, wouldn't look at it. Okay, granum. Put a granum on, wouldn't look at it. So I thought, right, practice what you preach. So I just stopped and I looked down and it didn't take long, just a few seconds. And I saw an aphid and I saw another aphid. I thought, oh, I wonder if they're on aphids. So I put a little size 20 aphid on. For the rest of the day, every fish I cast to, I either caught, lost or missed. Even though there was flies on, large darks, granum on, five, six times the size of the aphids that started on aphids and that's all they would look at. You know, and that's what it can be like sometimes. So, you know, rather than tear your hair out and go through your box, just stop and watch sometimes. Yeah, that's some great advice there. And I think, you know, what you've said there is is also key that probably if you can't figure it out, it will be something very small. So my first port of call, I think, if I can't figure it out, will be midges. And then, you know, like I said, if the wind's blowing, I think terrestrials immediately come in. And as part of that, the aphid side of things as well. And it, it tends to be generally here back end that that they tend to eat those aphids a little bit more, but they'll be around all those sorts of things. But again, it comes back to that theme, doesn't it, about observation. But yeah, if you're struggling and you can't figure it out, small is the way to go. And I I carry a, a box, and again, my friend Warren tied some beautiful 20s, 22s, 24s that I've got ready should I need them. And after mayflies, I don't know if you find that fish can sometimes come off the boil a little bit, and they'll go on to midges for a bit, and then it might be caddis. That tends to be the way through with some blue wings and and everything else. But but yeah, I, I look for those big plumes of midges, and we've seen some huge ones already this year. But that that's a good place to look, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I often think if I see a fish rise, especially if they're sipping on the flats, if I can't see what they're taking, my first thought is small. You know, if you can't see it, it's got to be small. And I'll, I'll I'll go on to midge or something like that. Um, but another thing I often say to people, and it it may be worth thinking about, is one of my favourite sayings, and I'm always saying it to clients: a good angler is a thinking angler. You know, think about what sh- what you should be doing. You know, what angles me f- fly fishing at? What size do I want? Angle of approach, because that's another thing as well uh, to think about. And I, you will know all this, Pete, but. Sometimes you can stand in one place and chop and change flies and chop and change flies. And the fly, you've, the first fly you put on might be the right fly. It might be your angular presentation. So sometimes rather than change flies, move your feet and present it from a different angle. That's some fantastic advice. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And sometimes that can make that cast a little bit easier as well. And like you say, for that reason, you know, I've talked on here before. I've even done it on a podcast where I've caught a fish with a downstream pe- presentation as well. Are you are you a fan of a downstream dry? Yeah, yeah, on occasions. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'll, I'll put a parachute cast in and drop everything and just let it float onto fish. I mean, I don't do it a lot, but... I have had occasions where you're quietly moving up a river and a fish will rise behind you and you can just turn around and drop a fly onto it. Yeah, no, it's some great advice there. And, and, and you know, being outside of that box, as we often talk about, sometimes can make or break a day in and, and, and bring out a, a wonderful surprise. But we've been talking about techniques and guiding and everything else. What made you want to become a guide and instructor? Um, where did that path begin for you and, and how did you find it? Um, it's something I always fancy doing because I've fished well all well nearly all my life um so it was something I always fancied doing but being married with a young family and a mortgage it was something I couldn't afford to do because uh it was never that rewarding financially or it never appeared to be but uh I got made redundant uh in 2007 and I was just at that stage of my life where the family was grown up and left home. My wife was working and we weren't well off, but I was the pressure was off to a certain extent. So I thought, right, if I'm going to try it, this is the time to do it. And I thought I'd better get a qualification. So I went down the EAP guy route, um, got me provisional in 2007, 
and me advanced in 2009 and uh, and I've just been doing it since then basically but but the main reason I went down it was it was it, it was something I always fancied doing because of the love of the sport really and passing it on and and to be honest I, t- I tend to prefer teaching people techniques and things like that as opposed to casting you know teach them how to fish yeah, no, that's that's a, a a very salient point, and it's one I I kind of enjoyed as well. That you got somebody. I used to love taking people who had come from a still water background, or and I spent most of my time trying to get them to reel the line back on their reel that they'd pulled off about four miles of it, and um, that sort of stuff. Or how do I improve a little bit? Days like that are absolutely. Wonderful. Did you learn something about yourself as an angler and as a caster during that process? Uh, yeah, I learned a lot. I mean, uh, I always thought I could cast, but I didn't realise, you know, what it was about until I went down that route. And um, and I still say now, you know, I mean, um, you can you'll, you'll catch fish with it. You know, if you, as long as you can cast, you'll you'll always get the chance of catching fish. But if you can if you can cast you don't see many, you don't see many good fishermen that are bad casters. So I think going down that route made me a better fisherman. You know, using all the different. I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't use all the different casts. But when I'm when I'm um, when I'm spider fishing, I tend to spare cast all the time. Um, in certain situations, I'll use the presentation cast, like the reach mend and you know the serpentine cast and things like that. So it, for me, it, it I think it made me a better fisherman. You know, and, and I often say that to people, you know, being a better castier will make you a better fisherman because you'll cope with situations much easier than, you know, you can if you're not a great caster or not a good caster. And that was, I think that's the difference when you get in those difficult situations, high winds or heavily overgrown banks and things like that where you, you, things are a bit tight or um, variable currents where you need a, a little bit of slack line. And I think it's a little place times like that when it makes the difference. Absolutely. And yeah, being able to cover the fish makes life a whole lot easier, doesn't it? And tell me about that first day, that first day that you had either instruction or guiding. How was that? And do you remember it well? Yeah, nervous. Uh, And like I said, I don't know what you were like, but when I first started off, I always wanted people to catch. I put pressure on myself because I want people to have a great day and a great day was getting loads of fish. So, and I found it very frustrating at first because, like I said earlier, you know, you know the fish are there. You take them to all the pools where you know there's fish, and the fish don't perform. So, I used to find it very frustrating initially. I started to relax a bit after a while because you realise, you know, the wild animals, you know, they're not going to switch on when you want. So, sometimes you know you've just got to accept it's not going to happen. But initially, I found it very frustrating. Yeah, yeah, and you go through that spell. I think that it's almost download, isn't it? That it, it can easily be you're teaching someone like you're taking the exam again. It just doesn't need to be like that, does it? And you know, it's a fun. You're trying to, and it's all well intentioned, of course, but you're trying to show them everything, and it doesn't need to be as intense. And like you say, the word relaxed, and then you know whether it is getting that first fish in the net of the day whatever that may be then once that's underway then you discover actually i don't need to be as technical about this and 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 all of a sudden that process changes a lot and becomes a lot more stripped out and and a little bit more bare doesn't it do you find the same yeah it's yeah and it's 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 again it comes with experience it's striking that balance because you, you want to show people enough but you don't want to show them too much because there can be information download, uh, overload if you want, and they go away and their head's spinning, and it's striking that balance between not enough and too much, and and that just comes with experience. I think you know. I mean, I, I still get guys now, you know, um, and it's question after question after question, and I, I'll sometimes say, "This is too much. You're not going to take all this in. It's it's too much for you," you know. But but it is a difficult one to strike sometimes. Yeah, I found that um, I stopped, and I was having this conversation with somebody the other day, I can't remember now, um, about the first thing you tell 
people or show them they remember the most. So I stripped out talking about the tackle till later because why do I want them to know that we have different lengths of rods and lines and everything else as the first thing? Let's teach them a cast and let's show them how to do that rather than giving them that information that's probably going to be the, the main chunk that they hang on to that, that largely speaking isn't the most important yes it's important but i'd much rather they could cast a fly line so that when they'd had a day with me that they could go fishing for the rest of their lives so you sort of change don't you that process of 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 the teaching and 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 alter it yeah and another thing i've found as well apart from the cast i mean normally after i teach i normally show people two casts the roll cast initially and then the overhead cast I think the roll cast a nice relaxed cast and it just gets them used to the feel of the rod, um, power application, things like that. And then I'll, once we move on to fishing, the first thing I talk to people about is river craft, being able to read a river, because I find a lot of people can't read a river. You know, it's great if the fish are rising, it's like, hello, Pete, I'm here. But if they're not rising, where do you go? Where do you start? And uh, and I, like I say, I find a lot of people can't do that. I mean, I've had guys come to me and they're struggling, they're not catching. And I'll say, well, where do you fish? And they'll point areas out and I'll say, that's why you're not catching, you're fishing the wrong water. You know, so, so river craft, being able to read a water, whether it be river or still water, to be honest, is important. Yeah, yeah. The, the old bubble lines, we used to just teach them foam is home and then work whereabouts they might be within the pool. But, yeah, foam is home was the one we always used to get them. Yeah, one of my favourite series. I used to say, think of the, well, I still say, think of the river as a food factory. And it's a conveyor belt. This moving water is a conveyor belt, and it's carrying the food to the fish. And where is this conveyor belt going to carry the food? Where does it concentrate the food? Look at the channels. Look where food will be funneled, because that's where the fish are likely to be. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, We've been talking for over an hour now, so we're going to just take us in another direction. I told you we wouldn't. I had. I always um, say to my guests that I have some rough questions, but I do really try hard to let the conversation flow as naturally as possible possible and as it has done today we've been chatting over an hour but tell me jeff that away from home where is your dream destination where is the place that you love to fish or where is the place you would love to fish uh well don't get me wrong pete uh but i'm 64 this year so i think my options are limited um and i've been to new zealand twice and I'd, I'd have been well. I'd have been another two times if it hadn't been for COVID. Because the plan was, as long as I've got my health and I can afford it, I'll go every year. So my dream destination is New Zealand. Um, there's other places I'd probably fancy going. I mean, talking to to Paul Proctor, you know, I mean, you know how much he travels, and he's been to some fantastic places. And there's one or two I'd be tempted with, but but now I think me it, time's limited, and it's it's just New Zealand's the priority. If I can get back there. That's where I want to go. And I love it over there. And plus as well, there's no, nothing wants to kill you over there. There's no snakes or anything like that. So I like that as well. Yeah, I'm with you 100% on that one. Snakes are the only thing I hate. And yeah, you can walk through the grass, everything else. There's nothing rattling, slithering or curled up ready to bite you. So I'm perfectly with you on that one. That's a good choice. It is amazing how... It is such a an amazing place, and so many people choose it as their dream destination. Tell me something else. If you're going on a road trip and you had to have a song to start that road trip, what would your song be? What would you choose? I'll put you on the spot a little bit with this one, but what would you choose? What would be the one that would be the sound? I'll tell you what, if you want them, you can have two songs. What would be the ones that would um, set the tone for that road trip in the car as you got in on an early morning on the way to a river somewhere? God, that's a difficult one, that. It depends on the mood. Um, I mean, I tend to, like, well, I'm, I'm back, I'm into... Creedence clear water again at the moment so maybe green river um i like um chris rear so it's maybe not an appropriate one for going to the river but road to hell something like that nice nice choices absolutely 
um, Tom Tom Petty I like. Uh, um, I've got Bob Dylan's greatest hits. Some of his songs are uh, you know are really really good. So I think a lot depends on the mood. I don't know about you, but sometimes if I like something a bit slower, and then sometimes I like like something a bit more upbeat. But but probably Chris Rea or or Creedence Clearwater at the moment. Nice, nice. Nothing wrong with those at all. Um, you said Tom Petty as well. I remember last day of fishing. I took a group down to Montana a few years ago, and the guide um, Vern had Tom Petty in his car, and I thought, "Yeah, I'm in Montana." Um, we're heading back. We've had an amazing trip and Tom Petty, cause I, I didn't know who it was. And he said, Oh, I said, who's this? He said, Tom Petty. I said, yeah, it's a great soundtrack. So yeah, it's always nice to hear people's choices. So what is your perfect day on the water? How would you describe that? I've got the sense cause I think we've probably circled around it, but what's that perfect day on the water for you? Oh, nice, relaxing day. Uh, fly on the water, fish rising. And just wandering around, picking off rising fish. Like I say, it doesn't have to be many, um, and, and they don't have to be big either. Um, I mean, getting back to social media, it's not a dig at social media, but you know, I've, I've noticed, and I do it on purpose sometimes because I love all fish. Like you said earlier, no matter what the size, and sometimes I'll I'll put a picture of a small fish on, and it's interesting how many. Not that I, I don't do it for likes, but I, I, I'll I laugh, I smile to myself sometimes because. You see how many legs you get for a small fish compared to a big fish, you know, and there's no comparison. You know, I, put, I mean, this year I was lucky to get me biggest ever UK fish uh, and I got hundreds and hundreds of likes, you know, and I'd put a, f- a small fish on and you, you might get half a dozen if you're lucky. And like I say, I don't do it for that, but it's just, it makes me smile sometimes. I think, mm, you know, they're both beautiful fish. Size shouldn't matter. Don't Don't get... Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not criticising people that like big fish. You know, I, I would never, ever do that. You know, we're all different. We've all got our own thing, you know. But to me, I just think they're all beautiful. And it's never bothered me, size or numbers. I'm not a fishmonger, you know. It, it's never bothered me. It's I, I'm lucky. I've had some nice fish, some big fish. But, you know, even, this, even the small ones, you know, the lovely fish. I mean, I don't know about you, but I look at them sometimes and I think, God, that's beautiful. You know, and sometimes when I do t- get fish and I'll take a picture, I'm always very, very careful. I keep them in the water. I mean, if anybody looks at any of the pictures, sometimes they'll see water dripping off the fish because I've got the c- camera on a timer and, you know, it, the fish never comes out of the water until it's the phone starts beeping. Uh, sorry, the camera starts beeping. But even then, I put it back and I think, oh, I hope it's all right. Yeah. Yeah, that's good advice. I, I know the one, the first time I used the the timer just the other day and I was sort of knelt down and exactly the same and all I cared about was making sure I got that fish back. So it was one quick go and off it went. And I think that's a, a cool way to do it. So that's great. Jeff, this has been wonderful chatting with you. How can people find you? You sound a guide's guide as well, but a, a wonderful person to spend time on the river with how can people find you um what's your website details and your social media handles should they want to find you uh social media is just the eden angler on uh, facebook and instagram and twitter um the website is www.theedenangler.co.uk um most people find me through the website Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Jeff, I've really, really enjoyed talking with you this morning. Um, Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you, Pete. I've enjoyed it too, and I hope it's been all right for you. Absolutely. I've really, yeah, I I think listeners will enjoy it as much as I have done to listening and, and learning a little bit. And, you know, like I said, the conversation's taken a, we were going to talk about Charles Ritz and all sorts of things and how smoking was into time with fishing never went there, but it's not a less conversation for that. I've really enjoyed. And I think, and I hope listeners get um, some value out of that and learn a little bit and, and take something from your skills as a fishing guide as an, and as an angler as well. So thank you so much, Jeff. It's been brilliant talking with you today.
Come everyone, this has been the Fly Culture Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Um, as you'll see, these aren't scripted. They are not edited. There's nothing changed on them. The conversation just goes where it goes. And I hope you've enjoyed it because of that. And if you have, perhaps you'll consider subscribing. And um, thank you so much for listening. There'll be plenty more of them coming very, very soon. The Fly Culture Podcast is brought to you in association with Fly Culture, a quarterly print magazine. For more information, please visit flyculturemag.com. You can also find Fly Culture on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter.